Hey everyone, Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Executive, here with Bulletproof Radio. Today's guest is Dominic D'Agostino. He's an assistant professor of molecular pharmacology and physiology at USF Health Morsani College of Medicine. And one of the guys I really look to for knowledge about ketosis, that fat burning state that we try to be in on the Bulletproof diet most of the time, but not all the time. So we're going to pick his brain today about how it actually works, the benefits of ketosis, the risks of ketosis, etc. He's presented at TEDx and done a ton of different studies looking at metabolic disorders, Alzheimer's disease, muscle wasting, cancer, oxygen toxicity, all kinds of cool stuff that you might not think applies to you if you just want to feel good all the time. But it turns out the things we learned by looking at the corner cases really help us know more about what's going on on our end. Well, it looks like you work out a little bit. I've seen some pictures of you. I'd say you're a little more muscular than the average guy. Would would you say that's true? Uh, maybe. Yeah, I guess so. I'm pretty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I work out. It's part of kind of what I do. Uh, although I don't have a whole lot of time uh, nowadays, but. You know, powerlifting was a big part of, you know, uh, my college days. And uh, I do kind of network pretty closely with uh, the natural bodybuilding world and, and have a few close friends that are tied to that community. So, yeah, definitely an interest there. Now, at the same time, you're into the keto diet or different ways of getting yeah. into ketosis. Are you in ketosis all the time? I, I think so. Yeah, pretty much unless I slip on my diet, uh, unless I eat something out of the ordinary. But generally, uh, yeah, if you measure my blood ketones, yeah, it would it would show that I'm in ketosis 95% of the time or more. Sometimes I overeat on, you know, protein and or occasionally I'll go out to the movies and have popcorn, but that's pretty rare. What? Special GMO events. GMO popcorn, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, 95% of the time. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Obviously, it's, it's my research field, and uh, I do it for practical reasons, too, because staying in ketosis prevents me from getting hungry. So, I eat two meals a day, spaced roughly about 12 hours apart. And, uh, you know, I come from a background of eating, like, six meals a day, and I, I can't imagine going back to that pattern of eating or having the time or patience to do all the food preparation and the shopping and everything involved in, you know, eating multiple times a day, which a lot of people feel that they need to uh, for performance. But I, I know that's not the case. <laughs> you and me both. Uh, the idea of many meals a day is exhausting and just <laughs> why would you? Uh, so... Can you kind of summarize your research? I did my best. I mentioned some of the fields. But for people listening, yeah, ima good. imagine they're driving. Imagine that half of them have heard of ketosis. The other half may be interested in just you know, how do they perform better or how do they lose weight. So a little bit of an explanation of ketosis, how you enter it, and also why do you care about it at the levels where you're doing research? Okay. Uh, I got into this research because I was uh, – intensely looking into an anti-seizure strategy and kind of exhausted all options. And then I, I discovered that the ketogenic diet, uh, I thought it was used primarily for weight loss, but I discovered the real, <clears throat> you know, function of the diet, how, how it came about was for controlling drug resistant seizures. And it has roots back in the 1920s and earlier. And that was essentially what I was being paid to do, to develop an anti-seizure strategy for oxygen toxicity, which can happen under while breathing a high-pressure oxygen uh, with, a, with a special unit. The special ops guys use a, a closed-circuit rebreather, and it can create seizures if they dive too deep. And... Um, you know, so the the diet interests me. You know, the the evidence showed that it was probably better than than most drugs out there, and obviously it didn't have side effects associated with anti seizure medication. 
And I became interested in that, but uh, more importantly, interested in how to mimic this with a, a ketogenic agent. And the ones that were out there are like MCT oil, but I <clears throat> wanted to develop a ketone ester, which if taken orally can put you into starvation level ketosis in like 15 minutes to a half hour and sustain it for hours. So in the process of, of developing that and testing that, we sh demonstrated that it it's, uh, has a very strong anti-seizure effects and that ketosis has a broad range of applications for uh, neurological diseases and even cancer we're studying now. Um, and from a performance enhancement point of view, ketones function as an alternative fuel for your brain. And, and for your muscles too. So we are looking at uh, uh, you know, the application of a ketogenic diet and also supplemental ketones to enhance cognitive performance and also physical performance. I, I'm working on some studies of my own given that I make mm -hmm. MCT oil and some of the even more filtered versions yeah. like my brain octane stuff. Uh, I'm I'm interested in the cognitive performance aspects of it, so I, I've done some limited experiments with EEGs, and mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of amazing what mental endurance does when you have ketones in the body. Uh, where can I get some of these ketone esters you're talking about? Sign me up. <laughs> uh, well, they're they're pretty new, actually, at least in our lab. Uh, there's the military has been working on these these things for a while, uh, maybe the last ten years, but probably in only the last few years have they been able to be produced in a way that's safe and that can be applied to to humans. Um, ketone esters probably won't be available for a while as a nutritional supplement. Maybe as a medical application, they taste horrible. You know, sk stomaching them is, is really a hard thing. Uh, I, there the, is the a product. I've heard is that they taste like ass, like worse than glutathione <laughs> so far. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they do. There's not a whole lot of people who, who have consumed them, so I probably know the person you're talking about because <laughs> uh, there's a very limited amount of people who have used these, maybe some advanced athletes and military guys. Yeah, this but, would be a military uh, connection. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, th there is, you know, Patrick Arnold, there's a chemist, yeah, he's a chemist. He has a company called Prototype Nutrition, and he sells a product called uh, KetoForce, and and that is kind of like a you know a poor man's version of a ketone ester, I think. And it, it uh, it's essentially ketones that can be absorbed and and rapidly assimilated and used for fuel. And our lab has found that you know that that's a very effective way to elevate ketones, but it's even more effective when it's combined with MCT oil. Uh, so we're testing this right now, and uh, and you know the performance, the the application for this for cognitive function and performance is very real, and I think it would be best used if in athletes that are already keto adapted meaning that their their systems are already used to kind of utilizing ketone bodies as an energy substrate uh, and you know when, when we're in a keto adapted state the mechanisms for utilizing and transporting ketone bodies to muscles in the brain are upregulated and um, I have a hunch just based on our research that that a person wanting to enhance performance would be best suited to use this in combination with a low carbohydrate diet. So this has been kind of an ongoing question. I use I a I lot know. of brain, the brain octane, which is the shorter chain MCT is extracted from plain MCT oil. And I, I use both of them, but yeah. I get a lot less of the GI problems when I use that. And I use it primarily for cognitive enhancement and I'm doing probably four tablespoons of the stuff a day, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Now, I can use ketones for energy all day long. I feel great. But I do eat carbs, probably 50 grams, sometimes 100 grams, and sometimes I go deep into ketosis. Am I going to be able to burn ketones and use those at the same time there's some glucose in my body if I have an extra normal amount of ketones because I'm taking all that oil? Yes. Um, the work of, you know, I just 
recently there was a Joe Lamana, who's a top ketogenic diet researcher, uh, gave a talk here at University of South Florida. And his research has shown that ketones spare glucose in the brain. So the brain will preferably use ketone bodies over glucose. And I get this question a lot. Are ketones the preferred source of energy for the brain? And I get this question, you know, no less than 50 times, I think. And I always said, well, we don't know that. Uh, the emerging research that's just starting to come out and will come out in the next year will demonstrate that ketone bodies are, in essence, a preferred fuel that the brain will use them in place of glucose and spare glucose. Um, we know from the work of Richard Veach and, and several others that ketones are a uh, very efficient metabolic fuel, probably more so than, than glucose. So you have an alternative fuel that can potentially enhance you know, metabolic efficiency and ATP production uh, and that can spare glucose. And I think that's, that's in part the big the big advantage of the ketogenic diet is that, you know, when you're following a ketogenic diet and you're exercising, you can tap into your fat reserves and, and mobilize fat as a fuel source more efficiently and thereby uh, preserving glycogen stores. So, and, and the ultimate determining factor, you know, and how long you can go is the preservation of glycogen stores. You know, once they're depleted, you basically bonk. Uh, if you're on a carbohydrate restricted diet, your diet sounds like it's carbohydrate restricted. Fifty to hundred grams is yeah, and and you are you're essentially in ketosis. You're bouncing in and out. I think you're probably right, an so. active guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so you would pro in some ways that could be optimal because a very strict ketogenic diet that's used for clinical application, I think, is is very is is restrictive and it may not be optimal. And uh, the athletes that I'm talking to and, and, you know, even myself, I think it's, it's helpful to have some amount of carbohydrate in the diet because your body, uh, if, if there wasn't, your body's transport mechanisms will likely be downregulated. So keeping a little bit of carbohydrate in your diet, which I do too, in the form of, you know, uh, salads and, and dark chocolate I probably have every day. <laughs> I limit it kind of like you on real active days, maybe up to a hundred, but on typically fifty, and it, it comes mostly from blueberries, you know, dark chocolate and yep. broccoli, asparagus, stuff like that. Stuff you probably consume. So uh, I've I've gone very strict ketosis, and I've done this kind of you know very minimal carbohydrate restricted uh, diet, bordering on I guess what's considered a paleo like diet and I feel better if I have a little bit of carbohydrate in my system so so I'm kind of with you on that and I'm always in ketosis so even if I don't take supplemental ketones I'm, I'm always some level of ketosis so. I, I found yesterday I was I tried one of these new keto blow sticks have you seen these things yeah I'm testing them now <laughs> actually <laughs> yeah. wow I'll show so you mine you, if you show me yours yeah we're yeah we're like yeah not too many people have this. So I'm curious. So you must know Metron or the people from Metron, I think. I know one of yeah. their advisors uh, who's testing okay. it out and hooked me yep. up with them. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I'm quite intrigued, although it didn't turn purple yesterday. But I, when I travel, I tend to eat more carbs because you're at a restaurant. Like, I'm not eating your crap meat. At least yeah, I'm yeah. only grass-fed. So I'd rather eat white rice soaked in MCT and butter and vegetables than I would their industrial chicken or some crap. So I'm willing to yeah. go out of ketosis and still eat a lot of fat. Sushi in, in MCT is also good. So <laughs> you're the your... only guy who's ever said that. I, yes, it's a statement. Really? Yeah. So you eat a lot wow. of sushi with MCT. Yeah, I was given this uh, this suggestion by uh, yeah by a fellow that used to be worked for NASA. Actually, was one of the directors at NASA and, and jumped on the ketogenic diet, and it's kind of really literally changed his life. So he's like, you gotta try sushi with MCT. So I brought my my MCT to to the sushi place, and I got some strange looks, but it was delicious. I wonder sure. if. Uh, if he might have got that for me. I, I've been talking about this for a while on the podcast, but I've done it in Hawaii. I've given it even in Japan to sushi chefs, and they try it, and they give me this look like, oh, my God, it's really good because you think <laughs> coconut yuck, but it's just in more rice and more fish, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and oh, it's, it's a flavor carrier. And that's really why, you know, MCTs are used in food products. They're a flavor enhancer. It really helps the, the food spread it out on your palate. And, yeah, it's, it's definitely it, a flavor enhancer. Even when I make uh, Bulletproof coffee, I put the Brain Octane in. I used to use my upgraded MCT, but I prefer just the straight C8. It works better, and it doesn't have yeah. as many of the GI effects. Um, when I do that, even like the coffee and the butter taste spreads out, the mouth feel is improved. And as mm-hmm. uh, somewhat of a chef, more like a molecular gastronomy meets health instead of flavor, mm-hmm. um, I think MCTs are essential for almost any meal if you want the maximum flavor. I, I haven't cooked anything without MCT on it when it was done in a long time. Yeah, I, I have MCT right by my stove. I use it. Uh, I cooked my eggs in it this morning. Uh, I put it on salads. I make salad dressing with it. Yeah, I can't. I can't think of anything I don't use MCT for. Actually, I make this keto pudding at night, chocolate keto pudding with like uh, whipped cream, and just get regular cream, right? And then mm-hmm. whip it so and so it has no sugar in it, and yeah. then add like stevia or something to it, and add chocolate baking powder to it. Yeah. And stir it in, and uh, and I put it in the freezer, and it's like chocolate mousse. You could do the same with sour cream. It works pretty good with sour cream. You could do the same with with uh, concentrated coconut milk. That's what I do. Uh, the coconut milk version. That was I my do? birthday cake. That was exactly. Oh that. wow! All right. Since we're sharing, these recipes, are things I only thought I knew. Yeah, so I, I am I shocked that people. you know this. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I actually make a, like, a chocolate, the upgraded chocolate. I'll send you some just as a uh-huh. as a thank you. Okay. It's a powder that's raw and it's tested for absence of mycotoxins from ancient species with more antioxidants and whatnot. But it's yeah. I use that. I use sugar alcohols. By the way, what do you think? Xylitol, erythritol? Yes, no? Yeah, I uh so, you know, stevia powder is really concentrated and sometimes I'll take the xylitol, Jeff Volick, you know, it's some of his ideas, uh I borrowed from him for with that idea, and that's that's pretty good. I like it. Uh, yeah, I use. I I think it's okay. You know, the sugar alcohols that are in a lot of protein bars and things like that, it can be pretty uh, can cause some GI issues. But yeah. xylitol's xylitol's pretty tolerable for me. Uh, me too. I, I tend to use a blend taste, of the two, but if you take too much too fast, uh, not a good thing for the people around you. Yeah, yeah. So all right, here's I try to wean. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I try to wean myself off, you know, uh, hyper sweet things anyway. So I'm using much less sweetener, overall sweetener now. Uh, me and, too. I, I don't want to swim in it. I don't want to crave the sweet taste. But some yeah. recipes, like just to get a sweet yep. hint at the end of barbecue, how it's not barbecue without a hint. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, so, so here's the trick to enhance your whipped cream thing or to do it with coconut milk. Melt straight cocoa butter. Not the powdered baker's chocolate, but actually just the that when you're whipping it yeah you that in and the heavier saturated fats and the chocolate flavor there make the mousse hold up better when you freeze it and mm-hmm. it totally changes the mouthfeel it, it's transformative you feel so like you're cocoa, eating a, yeah, cocoa yeah. butter yeah and that melts at a high, much higher temperature than like just you know coconut oil or co- it's it's uh, it comes in white it's yeah. white or off white yeah i'll yeah, send okay. i'll send you some I, yeah. I was, those are two of my core food items that i ended up putting on the site because enough people were asking about it yeah um but the the reason that that feels good is it melts i think at 98 right around 98 99 right about body temperature cocoa butter melts and then you get the mm-hmm. the lower temperature cocoa butter so when you put it in your mouth you get the different fats melting at different times and it for a fat mm-hmm. adapted person, it just makes you smile. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, how exciting. I had no idea anyone else knew that recipe. That's cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've done a lot of experimenting. Yeah. Uh, well, you um, have to. You have to once yeah. you start doing this. And, and also, I, I work with, um, well, I, I communicate with a number of patients who are adapting this for to manage uh, you know, a disease process. So compliance is the major issue. And weaning someone off really high carbohydrates to a ketogenic diet to manage epilepsy or even even cancer can be tricky. And uh, and these these little these desserts these hints can can have mean the difference between compliance and no compliance. So they've really been helpful for a lot of people that I know. It it should be Your delicious. Bulletproof you... coffee has been too very oh, helpful oh, really? for a lot of people that I know patients. Yep, very okay. much so. Thanks for letting me know. I. I like to imagine people who 
for their own life need ketosis that for me that was the easiest way to get in and turn off food cravings uh, and just stay in as long as i wanted so it is working do you put protein in it for these people or do you just tell them to go for pure fat um that that's an option uh what i do i do two meals per day and i do kind of fats in between and uh, like this morning, I had I had eggs and bacon and broccoli, I think. And uh, you know, throughout the day, I will have probably two cups of bulletproof coffee, and mid morning, and then again, you know, mid afternoon, about two, four o'clock. And I tell them to do the same because I can get my blood glucose down, which is kind of part of the therapy that we're working with, in the 60s, and then keep it. In, and sometimes it'll dip, you know, below 60. And and I take branch chain amino acids, so that's another thing that I well, tell those patients. Those raise your insulin, though, don't they? Uh, well, I haven't seen insulin's really dependent upon total calories, you know. And, and it, if it did raise insulin, it would really drop. It would really drop your your blood glucose, and I don't see that. I see a mild decrease in blood glucose, and. From all the blood work that I've seen, everyone's insulin is like through the floor. Like some cases, not even measurable. You know, and I'm, I'm you know, they're very on a very restricted calorie restricted carbohydrate uh, ketogenic diet. So if it is, it's very transient. And uh, and I believe, you know, if your body's hungry, if you're at a calorie deficit, the insulin will likely stimulate. You know muscle your your muscles are hungry so the glucose the little bit of glucose that's available will go into muscles okay it just gets used yeah and branch chain amino acids are anti catabolic too so i think they help preserve muscle tissue during periods of calorie restriction so i think they can be beneficial and they tend to dampen appetite too are you on a calorie restricted diet usually or not? <laughs> no i, I I don't. If if I was, def, if if there was a calorie deficit, I would be losing weight, and that's not the case. I typically maintain. I've lost some weight over the years as I've shifted to this pattern of eating. But I mean, I still, I'm still technically overweight. I'm like two twenty five, two thirty, and that's what I maintain. And that's just off two meals per day. But my meals are pretty big, like six eggs, yeah. you know, bacon, or or actually I had salmon with the bacon this morning. And, and then I'm in a fasted state now. What time is it? I haven't eaten in about 10 hours, 10 no, 11 hours. And I'm not hungry at all. I'm not the least bit hungry. And I, you know, a few 10 years ago, I could have never imagined going 11 hours during the day and not being hungry. And it, it I really would make have you no wanna, appetite. And I have a lot of energy. It, it's the energy thing that's transformative because normally yeah. you want to kill people or fall asleep when you're that mm. hungry, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a former 300 pounder, I, I'm about. I, I'm today, I didn't I've been putting on some muscle. Like I'm, I'm decent here. Yeah, not yeah, yeah. amazing. But so I'm, I'm probably only 80 pounds down from that. But I've been at around 200 plus some muscle ever, like for more than 10 years. And yeah. I remember the six meals a day were addictive. Where literally, if you don't get it, you're gonna crater. Mm. Now, and maybe, thinking that you needed it. Yeah. <laughs> And it's totally yeah. like just bad information, and having stress when it wasn't there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I, I decided to show that the calorie thing didn't quite work right. I thought I would make myself gain a few pounds, so I went on a very high calorie diet between four thousand and forty five hundred calories a day. I slept mm -hmm. five hours or less per night, and I stopped all exercise. And I was going to do this for a month or two. I was going to gain three pounds mm -hmm. and say, you know, the calorie tables say I should have gained 20 pounds. The equations are broken. I did it for two years and I grew a six pack. Uh, yeah. How does that fit into your research? Like, did I poop out a lot of extra fat? Like, how is this possible? There's a couple things going on and we're actually studying it, I think, uh, from a metabolomic point of view. So there's there's technology that's available where you can, uh, you know, pull blood and just look at the spectrum of metabolites and get some insight into how metabolism is working. Uh, in short, though, I mean, you push your body from a, a glucose sugar-based metabolism to a fatty acid and ketone metabolism. 
and, and going from point A to point B. And during that process, you've upregulated fat transport, you've enhanced mitochondrial function, mitochondrial biogenesis. So the mitochondria are basically the little organelles that are burning fat in your cells. And you've enhanced the number of mitochondria and their ability to, to oxidize fat for energy. And this is clear, you know, if you look at uh, athletes that are keto adapted, if you look at, you know, their respiratory quotient is much lower. So they're basically just burning fat completely for fuel. Uh, Jeff Volick is doing a lot of innovative, really cool studies on athletes that are fat adapted and gave me a little bit of insight into some some work that will be published pretty soon. And these guys are just like, they're burning fat off the chart. <laughs> are these you know, guys... their, their bodies are just oxidizing massive amounts of fat because they're completely on very low carbohydrate diets. Are these endurance athletes or are these uh, mm -hmm. power athletes? His guys are ultra endurance athletes. And we're setting up to do a similar study and put guys, uh, strength athletes on a ketogenic diet. And then, you know, look and do their blood work and just look at a whole variety of parameters to see. Wow. And we, we know these, these metabolic adaptations happen. You know, the body's ability to oxidize fat for energy is, is increased tremendously. And it'll vary between some people, but most people, you know, once they're fat adapted, uh, you, can, you can use objective measures like respiratory quotient to show that they're just pulling off their fat stores for energy. What's the downside of doing this? You know, that's a good question because uh, I do get an I do get some reports of people saying my LDL cholesterol is like off the charts, you know, and and everything. My L HDL went up, my triglycerides bottomed out, yep. my glucose is now under control, but my doctor sees my LDL cholesterol is elevated and is urging me to get off this diet. So uh, my response is something like. Okay, so all markers of metabolic health have improved. <laughs> <laughs> and you're telling me that one, you know, this marker of, of, of metabolic health that your doctor is saying is so important and the, the data is very fuzzy, conflicting and confusing whether that's the case. Uh, and you feel better, you know, your body weight's down. You're, you're telling me you're concerned that this high-fat diet is going to decrease your, your lifespan just because your LDLs, you know, 10 to 20 percent elevated, which they think is alarming. Um, that's what I've seen. A, a number, I would say it's as, it could be as high as 20 to 30 percent of people have this response, this increase in cholesterol. And it will increase total cholesterol because your good cholesterol goes up too Yeah. Uh, in, in most people. And then if your LDL goes up, that can be a problem. And it, Generally, it you know kind of stays the same, but in some people it does go up. So that can be a concern to some people, but I tell them not to worry about it. But a number of people that I've told that to went, you know, they trust their doctor and they're now on a statin. And uh, my mom actually went on a statin and uh, had a lot of side effects and had to get off of it. Is she on the uh, same diet? Not, no, not completely. I mean, I, I come from an Italian family where yeah. pasta was a staple, right? So uh, they've gradually, you know, replaced the starches with vegetables and have went to that that pattern of eating, but uh, uh, not completely ketogenic by, by any means, but much, much lower carbohydrate diet. So not everyone is going to be, you know, adapt to the ketogenic diet or low carbohydrate diet uh, but 90 in my my mind at least 90 percent of the people will have an improvement in metabolic health and their sense of well-being and pretty much all markers of of health will improve with carbohydrate restriction that i've wow. seen and i've been following a lot of people and you know i always i'm a I'm scientist so i want to see objective data i want to see blood work and i've looked at a lot of blood work and rarely do I see you know on a few occasions and and even on the few occasions where the blood work was kind of off you know I couldn't really confirm whether they were eating too many calories or actually following the diet when you tell people to measure their ketones and stuff it it's, it's kind of hard to get them to do it <laughs> yeah 
completely. Uh, so that that's usually an important thing. But usually glucose, triglycerides, and HDL will tell you the story. You know, they're the things that I and and things like C-reactive protein. You know, and markers of inflammation are important. But that was my next question. So I yeah. I notice when someone goes on the bulletproof diet which is a cyclical ketogenic diet. I tell them you know, once yeah. every week, maybe 10 days, eat some carbs to let yourself you know, come out mm. of ketosis and then go back in. Yeah. And you know, lots of upgraded MCT, et cetera. 70% fat. When they do this, you'll see HDL go up, you see triglycerides drop. Generally in six weeks, C-reactive protein goes down a lot. Homocysteine goes down a lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. yep. But... I also look at LP PLA two, because if LDL mm -hmm. goes up, which it does in some percentage of people, including me, my total cholesterol is uh, two fifty, two sixty. Mm -hmm. A couple of people have gone up to three hundred. People I work with, uh, but you look at LP PLA two, and it drops in all but two people who have other like smoldering infection kind of things. Yeah. So, so if you have high LDL and low LP PLA two, there's no vascular inflammation going on. Are, yeah. Do you feel comfortable if that was your numbers, if you had that combination of no inflammatory markers but high LDL? Yeah, yeah, I would be, I would be, most people okay. wouldn't be, but but I would be. I, I know that that's actually a pretty common scenario. Okay, yeah. I, I and, see uh, it and I have it in myself, and I'm totally comfortable with it. I perform better. Yep. All right, let's talk LPA. Mm -hmm. Just you know, LP little a. There's. Uh, Actually, before we talk about LPA, that's not the one I'm thinking of. I'm talking about uh, APOB. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, APOB is you know the the protein associated with fat transport. Yeah, that always goes up when people go on a, keto a ketogenic mm -hmm. diet. Why? Because you're transporting more fats. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and people always freak yeah, out when they see the, the numbers. The simple answer, yeah, is uh, is the right answer. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's the APOB48, the fat transport APOB versus APOB100 that most labs mm -hmm. don't look at at all. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that means if you're on the Bulletproof Diet, you're listening to this, and you have high APOB and your LDL is elevated, there's a reason for that. It's because you're in fat burning mode, which you wanted to be in. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Other big question for you, and this has been driving me crazy. I see in 20, 30% of people on the Bulletproof Diet, elevated sex hormone binding globulin. You ever come across mm -hmm. that in your group of people? And if so, why is this happening? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, some, some people have suppressed thyroid or T3 to T4 conversion too, uh, or T4 to T3 conversion. Um, it's important to uh, carbohydrate restriction and insulin <clears throat> could be affecting these things and regulating these things. So uh, that could be coming into play. Also, if they're on the diet, are they are they exercising? Are they are they over exercising? You know, uh, th there's a lot of factors coming into play. So y you need to control all, all variables, and I would need to see all variables to really yeah. comment on this. But um, this is what I, th you know, for males, they could be, this could be alarming, right? Because you're, you're binding up testosterone, so you have less free testosterone and to, to work at the receptor. But this is what I know, uh, is that when you're exercising, especially lifting weights, your androgen receptor density is going to increase at the, you know, at the cell membrane. And the little bit of, you know, testosterone, even if your testosterone goes down or, or more of it's bound and less in the free form, it's going to be more anabolic. You know, your receptor sensitivity will be higher. Your androgen receptor density will probably be elevated. And, uh, you know, I've seen people that have a lot of muscle mass. They go on a ketogenic diet. They perform very well. They retain their, their lean body mass even after losing a significant amount of fat. Then they go get blood work and their testosterone is like, you know, 260 on a scale of like 250 to 1,000, but they've, they're obviously, you know, that amount of testosterone is working for them. 
So I think their muscle, the muscle becomes sensitized to the effects of anabolic hormones and insulin too. You know, your insulin sensitivity goes up and uh, you secrete very little insulin, but it's working well. Uh, you know, these, a couple athletes that I know can consume carbohydrates <clears throat> and their uh, blood glucose doesn't even go, you know, above like 90 or 100 with a carb meal, you know. Because they're um, so sensitive. Yeah, because they're so sensitive. Um, All right. This is so interesting. I, I, so I don't, I wouldn't be alarmed. I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly why it happens, but I have seen that with carbohydrate restricted diets and, and people who over exercise too will tend to have a higher sex hormone binding globulin. Uh, okay. So that's, that's kind a of a great stress response. Uh, okay. One of the recommendations I make for people on the Bulletproof diet is follow body by science. Every seven to 10 or 14 days lift really heavy things until you can't anymore for 15 minutes and mm -hmm, spend a mm -hmm. lot of time recovering <clears throat> once you do that don't tend to have this problem the ones who have to do a workout mm -hmm. every two days to get the opiates those guys tend to run into this problem more exactly okay. that that's what i've seen uh I, I'm, I'm a minimalist when it comes to working out like maybe <laughs> I go heavy maybe once, maybe twice a week if I'm not traveling, and then just hit you know some chin ups and push ups and things at the house. Or, I, I do whole body okay. vibration uh, more for the lymphatic circulation, uh -huh. but you get the muscles yeah, down. Yeah. And yep. then uh, I do actually th everything I've got right now is all from electrical stimulation. I haven't picked up anything heavy in a while, but it's pretty sure. heavy electricity. Yeah, I haven't done that, but you know I'm aware of its benefits through you know, different, uh, for recovery type things and for yeah, therapy I, I, type. I was shocked at what it just does for, you know, I, I look like I've been lifting, but I really haven't. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, this is neat. So we'll see when this you get machine sore? Is, uh, you can get so sore you can barely walk. Okay. That's yeah. a good indicator that it's actually, uh, giving, uh, the, the force generation that's needed. I remember when I was younger, you know, in the back of magazines like muscle and fitness, you'd see, you see dudes all wired up with these yeah. things and it would just put, you know, millivolts into the muscle, not enough to really, you know, cause significant contraction. But I know now that there exist devices that can really cause a strong stimulation. And, oh, uh, I, so I had I, such I'm stimulation on my sternum. I'd actually, I got a bruise for the first time from, from using oh. this thing. Like it, it Interesting. it's rock hard. It's like you have a hundred pounds and you're really trying to just crank on your delt but the machine i have is it's a prototype you can't even buy it okay. so, uh, so when you do it this obviously hurts a bit so why don't you just exercise does it have benefits does the contractile force like above and beyond what you could do when if you just lifted weights it is oh. and okay. you also get neurological benefits so you get more myelination of the nerves which is what i'm going for okay so faster yeah. response times greater yeah so it, it's you know it's out there, and I'm not suggesting this for everyone by a long shot. Mm -hmm. The body by science protocols are well proven. Uh, at yeah. the same time, I get a much better vascularization, more allegedly more mitochondrial uh, growth. Yeah, and it, it's it, I'll tell you in another couple months where I end up. But so far, I've put on about 12 pounds of muscle in the past huh. month or so, in you know, 10 minutes every other day, kind of thing. I'm intrigued. Yeah, are you familiar with blood flow restriction? You know, occlusion training. It's called. No, it sounds so, awesome. Yeah, so you know, you put wraps around your arms here, around your legs, and you can lift 20% of the load that you normally do. And by impeding blood flow back, uh, you create. You essentially create. Uh, you know, an acidic environment in the muscles, and you create. Uh, you know, intermittent hypoxia, and that activates, you know, a variety of growth factors, including IGF-1 at, at that muscle where wow. you're impeding blood flow. And you can, it's, you have significant increase in muscle protein synthesis. And uh, one of my friends, Jeremy Lonecki, has published extensively. The Japanese people have been looking at blood flow restriction. They call it occlusion training. So just do a quick search on occlusion training. And you'll come up with a, a number of articles. Uh, one was written by a good friend of mine, Lane Norton. He's advocated this. Lane is a top uh, natural bodybuilder, and you know I've, I've trained with him. You know, calf training with him is just very painful. In this approach. <laughs> so so there, there's legit science. There's even journals. You know, oh, wow. journals of occlusion training. And so Would you, you hook can me use. Would you up with Lay? I, I want to get him on yeah, the podcast to talk about sure. this. What a cool idea. Yep. All right.
Yeah, uh, I'm gonna. That, that sounds right up your alley. Yeah, I'm gonna kind get of like biohacking. To, it turns out this podcast is now number one ranked on iTunes in health. So really? about half a million people a month will hear it. Yeah. So this yeah. is a way to get these ideas out there where people believe they have to work out, you know, 45 minutes a day, going for a run every day to feel good. It's like, like yeah. you're a pretty darn knowledgeable guy who's doing research on exercise, natural bodybuilding. Uh, you look great. And like, look at what you're doing. It's so different than what the mainstream is doing. And I'd argue it's more efficient and certainly more interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm all about saving time. So yeah. <laughs> you time is very both. important. Yeah. yeah. All right. One other big question you might be able to answer about oh a year ago year and a half ago when i was doing my four thousand calorie a day thing i decided i was going to try and eat like an eskimo so i eliminated all but one serving of green vegetables a day and i cranked up my fat and i was still eating a pretty good amount of meat tons of eggs stuff like that a little bit of Mm -hmm. weight protein all that and i did it for three months and during that time I went deep into ketosis, but I started waking up nine times a night. I'd wake up feeling exhausted. My Zio showed just almost no, in fact, zero deep sleep. I had dry, super dry eyes, super dry sinuses, a rasping cough that wouldn't go away. And uh, eventually I developed food allergies at the end of that that I hadn't had before. Have you seen this on people on extreme ketosis kind of diets like that? What exactly were you eating? (laughs) So eggs, for one thing, right? Eggs, which, by the way, I gave myself an allergy to, to my great annoyance. They were like one of my staple foods for 30 years. you're overeating eggs, probably. Probably because I was overeating them. And also because I I believe that I stopped making mucus because of the dry eyes, the nose problems, that I just didn't have enough polysaccharides to make it. Mm -hmm. And so the mucus that lines my gut went away. So I got gut permeability, and some of my favorite foods made it through my gut. And when I went off that diet... Uh, some of mm-hmm. my other things, like honey and sweet potatoes, which is how I refuel, boom, both of mm-hmm. those I, I've got uh, food re- reactions to now. Hmm. You ever That's seen that before? No, but I, I think, you know, th- this kind of diet, an extreme ketogenic diet, or maybe eliminating some foods that may have been providing some, mac- or some micronutrients that were essential for cellular function could have, could have in a way sensitized you you know I, I don't know how I know ketogenic diet when people start it and get into ketosis there's actually a flood of stress hormones yeah and there's you know the immune system is immensely complicated thing but uh, everyone's body can react differently to to stressors and uh, so you might have had like an overactivation of the immune system where it's picking up and detecting you know, certain proteins or food constituents are identified as antigens when they otherwise weren't before. And I know, you know, in a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet state, the body is kind of hypersensitive. And we see this even with drug administration, like you have greater transport of certain drugs across the blood-brain barrier, for example, uh, you know, in when, when your body is sort of hungry and in this fasted state. Um, so, getting back to your question, I don't know. I would I would have to see exactly what you've done and have to know a lot more information to really even comment. Uh, but it's not out of the ordinary. You put your body through through stress, and the adaptation to that stress can vary between different people. You know, and uh, we we kind of we study that in the lab. We look at like hyperbaric oxygen, and you know, a young person will have a more robust. Uh, adaptation to that stimulus than an older person. So they may confer some of the benefits, you know, as far as wound healing or mobilization of stem cells that an older person wouldn't have. So they would have an enhanced and heightened, you know, healing response compared to uh, an older person where hyperbaric oxygen may be just causing excess oxidative stress. So it's really maybe not the the you know, the dietary intervention, but your adaptation to it. And, you know, I, I've seen different things. I, I've seen some people who just cannot seem to adapt to a ketogenic diet. They feel awkward or they feel awful initially and they just, uh, they're just sluggish and they go back to eating carbs and, and they can, you know, they, they do well on carbohydrates. They're not, not most people do better, <laughs> 
yeah. on, on a low carb diet, but there are some people that I know that just kind of do better with the carbs in their diet. I, so just, I had one client uh, I'm thinking of, she's a really passionate, just powerful person. And after about three months without the refueling regimen, when I say every seven to 10 days, you know, eat some carbs. She wasn't doing that and she stopped dreaming and her sleep quality declined and she's kind of felt like she lost her her mojo a little bit of an edge she had and when she added <laughs> once a week carbs back in it worked so one of the reasons i built cyclical refeeds in but not crap refeeds but you know, just carbohydrate refeeds with low toxin carbs mm-hmm. on a regular basis was because well women need it more than men in my experience uh, and also it just seemed to head off some of these problems so you get the polysaccharides from mucus production and all um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wonder if the people who don't adapt to a wholly ketogenic diet would adapt to a cyclical one pretty easily. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, cyclical, I mean, that can vary between one diet that I followed before going completely ketogenic uh, was ketogenic in except, you know, during my workout, I would throw in carbohydrates, yeah. about 30, 30 to 50 grams right around the carbohydrate. And I called that the targeted ketogenic diet or cyclical. So, and and the carb frequency would depend on how many times I worked out per week. You know, if it was five days a week, I was eating carbs five days a week, but it was kind of a smaller amount. Um, yeah, I think women in particular do not adapt to the ketogenic diet as well as most males and I think yeah they'll get cranky they'll get uh, <laughs> some hormone hormone yeah. issues and stuff and I think that a lot of it they, they do need some insulin and they do um, their their hormone production seems to be somewhat dependent yeah. upon you know carbohydrates to some extent they seem to do really well though on MCT whether or not they're in ketosis <laughs> Yeah. Have you seen research about MCT and thyroid activation at all? Not MCT, but calorie restriction and thyroid. Uh, you know, th- your thyroid active T3 will definitely go down with calorie restriction, and your body temperature will go down with time. So, and some people who get on a ketogenic diet will comment on that, but what they kind of fully don't appreciate is that in many times a ketogenic diet will result in self-restriction of calories. So there'll be a mild amount of calorie restriction associated with a ketogenic diet uh, inadvertently. And calorie restriction over time can lead to a decrease in active thyroid. Uh, Excess training too much can lead to and act. I remember Ben Greenfield was was you know I was talking to him recently, and he had some thyroid issues with he thought resulted from ketosis, and you know, and I was like, uh, we were at the ancestral health meeting, and, and mm-hmm. I was like, well, what's your training like? And I was like, wow, it's, I think all my crazy. hormones would be in the floor if I was <laughs> to do that kind of insane training regimen. I don't know, my yeah. body probably could never take it. But I, I've uh, talked to him about that too. I'm like, oh, did you? Yeah, like, you're gonna get old someday, dude. Like, I know you're trying to protect <laughs> yourself every way, but maybe the answer is to not do that to your body. Yeah, I, he's gravitating to a more minimalistic approach. Oh, I think in his training. I hope he does because he's yeah. a nice enough guy, and yeah. you know, he uses a lot of the bulletproof products to stay in ketosis. Yeah, yep. Uh, and in fact, I'm having him on the show at some point coming up. Uh, I think after he does the Ironman, like drinking uh-huh. upgraded MCT kind of stuff. The, yeah. The question though is like long term longevity stuff, which is I'm as much an anti aging guy yeah. as I am a performance guy, and I just mm-hmm. don't believe that the chronic cardio uh, for years and years is going to make anyone live better ketosis or not. Uh, where do you come down on that spectrum? Yeah, I, it varies between people, but I, I think you know I do very little, if any, cardio. <laughs> Uh, I used to in the past, and I've experimented with it. I mean, I was into mountain biking for a while, mm-hmm. and uh, did a variety of you know different cardio things. And I just your body quickly adapts to it, so it's kind of it's like you're a rat on a treadmill. You know, you just kind of keep going with it. And if you stop, there's always the rebound effect. Uh, it's time consuming. I, I just there's just when it comes to metabolic health, you know. Uh, Lean body mass will always 
kind of win over <laughs> over uh, cardiovascular exercise in objective measurements of improved metabolic health. So decreased blood glucose, better insulin sensitivity, markers, you know, uh, your lipid profile overall will improve with a strength training exercise, you know, a, a weightlifting routine that optimizes lean body mass. So you're building metabolic tissue or metabolically active tissue that's just burning fat and helping to uh, keep your blood glucose low, which is going to decrease inflammation and, and everything else. So I, I, I know a number of people who've done like in preparation for contests or events who have just over exercised and you can't there's only a certain amount of time in the day you can't just keep adding hours and hours of aerobic exercise uh over time it's it's going to catch up to you like you you just can't <laughs> you yeah. can't do it and and when you stop people become insulin resistant you know and I, i've seen their blood work like oh, you know interesting I, and especially people in northern climates where you can't, you know, if you're up in, you know, Buffalo, New York or something and you're you're uh, a runner and you like to do it outside, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's not really good for your body to just prepare for a marathon, for example, and just put your body through all that stress. <laughs> well, I mean, look at what happened to the first guy who ran a marathon, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 that whole dying and celebrating his death. Always yeah, was yeah, funny. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, another question so, for you. What about kids? I mean, should kids be in ketosis? Like, what about my four-year-old? He's not, by the way. He just eats a ton of fat, but I don't think he's in ketosis. You know, he gets some carbs, mm -hmm. but uh, not an excessive amount of sugar and corn syrup mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Is ketosis optimal for kids, if that's the question? Uh, kids that are growing will benefit from having, you know, some amount of insulin in their body yeah. for growth and repair. And, and you know, that's why kids kids are getting so big now. And that's why people are, uh, women, girls in particular, are entering, you know, uh, adolescence and uh, much earlier now. Uh I think carbohydrate, well, I think kids are eating way too many carbs. So right. I think carbs in the diet are probably a good thing, but just to eliminate, you know, just, you know, grains and sugars and just kind of just uh, basic common sense stuff. Just yeah. basic carb. Yeah. I Carbohydrate restriction can be helpful for, for most kids. But then again, I mean, I'm looking and thinking about my nieces and nephews that are, their metabolisms are like on fire. So, yeah, and they they eat an enormous amount of sugar and carbs, and they're like super lean, like anatomy charts. So I think it's going to vary. It, you know, if your kid's fat, then restrict his carbohydrates and yeah. give them fat. Kids love fat. You know, they love uh, they love bacon, they love eggs, they love peanut butter. They love <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not hard to get kids to eat fat. And I think it's 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 it would be relatively easy to take out sugars and carbohydrates and replace it with fat kids most kids i know like fatty foods the, the first thing that my daughter ever asked santa for the first time she sat on his lap uh you know she was two two and a half or something and he says what do you want for christmas little girl and she says i want my own stick of salted butter <laughs> <laughs> and when i gave it to her christmas morning it, she picks it up like an olympic torch and runs around their house screaming with delight and opens it like a snickers bar and takes a bite and puts it back in the fridge and like, wow. their relationship with butter is, is very healthy. Uh, and they don't get carbs in the morning uh, six days a week because it makes yeah. them misbehave and then they want snacks and they're cranky. But they can have a few carbs at lunch, more at dinner, and it seems to help sleep. Um, so they're yeah. not you know, restricted. But in the morning, they eat eggs and salmon and bacon and some vegetables and nuts or whatever. But they do not uh, yeah. get you know fruit for breakfast. That's just not okay. Yeah, the, the studies that were done at like Johns Hopkins with kids that have pediatric epilepsy, they show pretty good that the ketogenic diet will not restrict growth and development, you know, like anti-seizure drugs, for example, and that kids develop and grow pretty well. I mean, uh, you're probably familiar with the Charlie Foundation. 
you know, yeah. the the Charlie Foundation kind of popularized the ketogenic diet. So it's it's a foundation that was started by Jim Abrams. He's a Hollywood producer. Right. He produced like the airplane movie, and his son Charlie had uh, seizures that couldn't be controlled. And then he discovered that the ketogenic diet, he was, in his own research, discovered that the ketogenic diet was used to control seizures and put his son on it. And it was like this magical cure that controlled the seizures and wanted to tell the world about it. So he created the Charlie Foundation and they're linked with Johns Hopkins Hospital. And now there's like probably at least 70 clinics you know, across the United States that are ketogenic diet clinics that put kids on the ketogenic diet and monitor their health. And Eric Kosoff and John Freeman have done incredible work to make this popular. Now, you know, now it's like the standard of care. When drugs fail, kids are put on a ketogenic diet. And enough studies have been done to show that it does not impact their development or their cardiovascular health. That is really good news for people who do have kids in ketosis. Yeah. Right? I think it's nice for them to have some carbs. They benefit from more carbs than adults, but not excessive and not the wrong types. Yeah, and, and I think you know it's really common. Like if your kid's fat, then just cut the yeah. <laughs> carbs. You know, if your kid's yeah you know, super lean and 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 you know hyper athletic and and growing and like playing football or some kind of sports, so carbs are easy calories to get in, and uh, and I think they can be kind of titrated into the diet based on activity level and based on your ability to metabolize them. And everyone has different carbohydrate uh, tolerance, you know, and I think it's important to know that. We're coming up on the end of the show. Mm -hmm. There's one question that I've asked every single guest, and that is based on all the things that you know. If there were three pieces of advice you had to share with someone who wanted to just kick more ass in all domains of life, not just food, what would <laughs> they be? Three, so you're asking for three recommendations. Yep. Well, I would take a step back and kind of look at your life and determine uh, what's not working and what has worked for you. And I would minimize or eliminate the things that do not contribute to productive patterns. Uh, and I would take a close look at the things that have gotten you to where you are today and uh, I mean this is going to vary between between a lot of people but I would take a close look at what has gotten you to where you want to be and these things are usually associated with time management uh, for me personally it's uh, diet and nutrition so following a ketogenic diet has actually been liberating in that it's been able to free up a lot of time for me and uh, as far as time during the day so I'm more productive and I have more energy to do the things that I need to do and uh, it's connected with me with a network of people that have helped my research and uh, inspired me to pursue and explore nutrition as a, a lifestyle. So when you when you feel good, you can be more productive. And uh, and so that was like two things: nutrition. Um, and I think when it comes to as far as physical health, uh, downtime is extremely important and a lot of people get so caught up in their jobs and don't take time, they don't take constructive, what I like to call creative downtime. So I think it, everybody needs to have creative downtime you know, scheduled into their day in one form or another. For some people that may be playing with their dog, and taking their dog for a walk. I don't know, working out, exercising, walk in the park, you know, fishing or whatever. But I think that needs to be incorporated into a person's day every day, if they can. Obviously, there's some situations where they can't. But I am much more productive if I schedule downtime into my, my life. So otherwise, I just get burnt out and become in, inefficient. Yeah, so. scheduled downtime, scheduled recovery time, uh, Great advice, man. Yeah. Where can people learn more about your research or what you're doing? Uh, 
You know, I, I have a website that's ketonutrition.org, and I get a lot of emails from patients seeking uh, seeking a metabolic therapy to manage either their weight or cancer or epilepsy. And what I do, I just compile the research on there, and uh, actually, I have clinical trials listed on there that people can seek if they're looking to manage metabolically manage some disease process. So ketonutrition org and uh, you know our publications which we have a, a number of them under review now uh, so I would just yeah look at those two things I think I, I put enough information on my my website ketonutrition.org I want to kind of develop more of a comprehensive website that tackles all these issues cognitive performance physical performance epilepsy cancer and be a little more interactive uh, that's kind of in the making, but I've been kind of too busy teaching and doing <laughs> research to really invest the time in to do that. So, Awesome. Thanks for being on the show, Dominic. Really appreciate all the knowledge you shared. Pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. So heart rate variability is the naturally occurring irregularity of a heartbeat. So if your heart beats at, let's say, 60 beats per minute, that doesn't mean it beats at one second intervals. In fact, that would be really unhealthy. That would be like a no HRV. It actually beats in say 0.98 seconds, 1.02 seconds, 1.04 seconds, and so on, and averages out to one second interval. 